Hi, everyone. Thanks for inviting me. Hello, v Vass? Vass? You need a new acronym, folks. All right? I'm telling you right now. Uh, so, yeah, Mark Redman is my name. I'm going to be the MC tonight. going to tell a story as well. And uh, I'm gonna st I was asked to start with how I got involved with the moth. First of all, the lawyers at the moth want you to know this is not the moth. It's not a moth production, all right? So we've got that out of the way. And uh, I always loved the moth. It started in 1996. It's on about 240 different public radio stations. It gets a million downloads a month on the podcast. And I like it because once in a while I'll have a celebrity. Most of the time it's ordinary people getting up to the mic and telling a really interesting story. That's what the moth is. And uh, I grew up in this big Irish Catholic storytelling family, all right? I grew up on Long Island. I'm the oldest of five. My father was the second oldest of five. They all had, everybody had four or five kids, and everybody lived one town away. So every celebration would be dozens of aunts and uncles and grandparents and cousins, and people weren't looking at their phones back then. They were actually talking to each other and telling stories. And my dad was the storyteller in chief. He would sit at the top of that dining room table and tell story after story. And each time he told it, it would get more fantastic and more incredible. He called me a few years ago and said, wow, son, you really have this storytelling stuff down. And I said, well, I learned it from you, dad. And he'd go, yeah, but mine were mostly bullshit. <laughs> Yours are actually true. So uh, on The Moth, if you listen to The Moth like I do each week, they always say something at the end of the show. They say, if you have a good story to tell, call 1-800-THE-MOTH and leave a one-minute message. And uh, if we like your, your message, we may call you back. So I did that. I did it in like 2012 or 2013. I might have done it a few times. Didn't think anything of it. And then in the summer of 2013, I get an email. And it's from a producer of The Moth in New York City. And in the email, she says, call me. We're coming to the Flynn Theater in September. And I want to hear your story. Maybe we'll put you on stage. So I called the woman, and I was like, what did I say again in that message? <laughs> I couldn't remember what story I left. So she said, oh, it's about a little girl and her brother and some church they belong to. I said, oh, OK, OK. So I told her the story. And she says, OK, you're in. I said, what do you mean I'm in? She said, we're going to have five storytellers. We're going to fly in our best storytellers from New York City and Chicago and Milwaukee. And you're the Vermont storyteller. You're representing Vermont. She said, we may have one other Vermonter. And Charles Lindbergh, the aviator, his daughter lives in the Northeast Kingdom. Reeve Lindbergh. So she and I were the two Vermont storytellers. So I am up on, the, on this Flynn stage. The lights is 800 people. You have 10 minutes to tell a story. And there's a guy with a violin seated right behind me. And he's got a stopwatch. And when that hits 10 minutes, he starts playing. But I had practiced like a million times. I uh, came in at 9 minutes, 45 seconds. I thought, I will be fine. There's some things I wasn't counting on. So I said something funny, and everybody's laughing. And I'm like, ah, stop laughing. But then I was like, I'm OK, I'm OK. I had 15 extra seconds. I can do it. So then I got a few more minutes, and then I said something inspiring, and everybody's clapping. And I'm like, OMG, I'm not going to make it. And then my friends in the audience are tweeting. I read the tweets afterwards. Redmond's not going to make it. <laughs> my money's on the violin guy. But I made it. I made it. And then. Uh, so there was a little reception afterwards for the storytellers. So I said to these people, so when do you think our stories are going to be on the radio? When are they going to be in the podcast? And they were like, no way. These things are taking place all around the world. None of our stories have ever been on the podcast. But uh, they put mine on. Did I just lose my sound? Is that, no, you got me? Uh, they put it on. They put it on. Then they played it again. They played it twice. 
So, uh, and then I heard about another storytelling podcast. They sent me to Montreal, then I went to Brooklyn, did one in Massachusetts. So one thing led to the other. Now I'm going to be on Broadway in a couple of weeks on a one-person show. Thank you. And the Flynn, which would be great. So now, after I did that, the moth started doing something called moth slams. That's a little different. They started at Skinny Pancake, now it's at Arts Riot. It's the second Tuesday of every month. Those tickets go on sale a week ahead. If you don't buy tickets within 24 hours, you are not getting in. Extremely popular. And each time you go, there's a different theme. So it could be fathers, delusions, greed, whatever. If you want to tell a story, you write your name on a piece of paper and you put it in a bag. And one by one, they will put all the way through five, they take a break, five more. And there's judges. The host looks for judges. Three teams of three people each. So they're going to score the stories. Now, there's a little trick to that. The more the judges drink, the higher the scores go. <laughs> so you never want to get pulled in the first five. You might as well tell your story and go home if you're interested in winning, which I always am. And uh, the winner of that night, they'll go January, February, March. So the 10 winners will then be in what's called the Grand Slam, which is back on the Flynn Theater. So that was my goal. If I can win a Moth Slam, I'll be back on the Grand Slam. So one time I told this story. After nine tellers, I had the highest score. And then this amazing storyteller named Josie Levitt. <laughs> no, she beat me by two tenths of a point. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Then the next month I go, I tell a story. After nine tellers, I'm the top one. The host goes, gee, we don't have 10 names. Who wants to tell a story? This woman gets up, beats me by one-tenth of a point. Then three months in a row, I went. I put my name in the bag. There were like 12 or 13 names in the bag. My name was not picked each time. Couldn't believe it. So now it's the night of the Grand Slam at the Flynn. And I am not eligible because I didn't win any of those times. It also happened to be the same day that my father, he was 85 at the time, and he was having a heart operation on Long Island, St. Francis Hospital. His aortic valve was shot, and he had to have a new procedure called TAVR. It stands for something. And at the time, <laughs> at the time, it was so experimental, Half the names would go in a computer of all the people who needed this. Half would get the operation, half would not. And he got lucky. His name got pulled out. So because I wasn't eligible for the Grand Slam, I went down to Long Island. And by the time I got there, the operation was over, and it worked. It worked. The doctors were like, it was a success. So I'm in there. He's in the ICU. It's me, my mom, my wife, Mary Beth, my son, Liam. He was like 10 at the time. So we're in there with my dad. He's in a bed. He's got tubes coming out of him everywhere. So we're happy. We're so psyched. And we spent a few hours. And then he started to yawn. And it was lunchtime. So uh, I hate hospital food. I said, let's find a restaurant. We'll go out. Then we'll come back. He's probably going to take a nap. So as we're getting ready to go, we said, Dad, we'll be back in like an hour. He said, yeah, let me get my coat. I'll join you. And he wasn't fooling. So that, like, should have been the sign to us that all was not really well. So we found some Greek restaurant in town, and we're drinking wine. We're putting pictures on Facebook. Yay, Dad's is going to be okay. And we get back to the hospital, and we get off the elevator, and the nurse is there. And she's like, where were you? Your father needs you to be here to ground him. So we go in his room. And he is just like in a state. Get me out of here. He's trying to pull all his tubes out. He's just like raging. So we're trying to calm him down. And then the nurse comes in and puts like these white, they look like white boxing gloves so he couldn't get at his tubes. And now he takes his teeth. It, it was Velcro. And he's like with his teeth. And I'm like, my father's a dignified man. He worked on Wall Street his whole life. He wore a three-piece suit to work every day. I can't believe this. So the nurse comes in with this big syringe. And I was like, what's that? And she said, Haldol. 
And I was like, can I have some too? So she gives him a shot and like, bang, he's out. But she said, this isn't going to last too long. You'll get a couple of hours of this, and then he's likely to be in the same state. So anyway, we huddled up. Me, my mom, my wife, my son. I said, listen, we better do shifts, okay? And I'll do the first shift. You guys go home and rest up. I don't want him waking up in the middle of the night, confused, not knowing where he is, trying to pull his tubes out. I said, I'll just sit here by the bed, okay? So they went home, and he woke up, let's say it was like 6 p.m., and man, it was more of the same. It was just trying to get out of there, trying to put his clothes on, trying to get his tube. It was just, it was unbelievable. It went on the entire night. I didn't get one wink of sleep. So at like 3 a.m., there was a male nurse on duty. I was like, hey, nurse, you have any more of that Haldol? Because that worked good. We love the Haldol. He was like, no. So uh, finally, my dad woke up like at 6 a.m. And it was like he was, whatever that was, was over, you know? He was like, in fact, he's looking at me like, what are you doing here? And he was himself again. So a few hours later, my mom came back, my wife, my sister, my brother from New Jersey. So we were there a few hours, and then finally I turned to my wife and said, I think we can go back to Vermont. I think he's okay. So anyway, I said goodbye to my mom, my sister, my brother. So I went up to my dad just to give him a kiss goodbye. I said, listen, we can come back anytime you need us, Dad. And he looked at me, and he said, uh, he said I adore you, Mark. I was 58 years old. I had never heard my father say that in my life, ever. He was just not the kind of father who expressed himself that way, right? Irish Catholic, like you knew he loved you, but you never heard him say anything like that. And honestly, I was almost stunned when he said that. And, I, and it was like, I knew in that second, like he did know that I was there. There was a piece of him that knew that I had been there the whole night. And I sat there and I thought, now I know why I lost to Josie Levitt by two tenths. Now I know why I lost to the other woman. Now I know why three months in a row my name wasn't picked out of that. Because if none of those things had happened, I would have gone to that Grand Slam. I would love to tell you that I'm bigger than that, and I, but I know myself. I would have come up with some excuse. And I would have missed out on the opportunity to... Uh, be there for my dad during the one time in his life that he needed me the most. Thank you.